Hello, I'm Jeff Tivialta, and I'm part of the pastoral staff here at Revive Church. I also get to serve uh, with our Spanish community uh, here at this church. And so I'm so glad that today you're, you're tuning in and spending this time with us. And we're hoping that if you're part of the Revive family, they have taken the time to look at uh, week one and week two and just internalize every single word that has been spoken. We hope that you have taken the time to be able to read through and even process some of this stuff. Because we believe that all these values that we've been sharing are the fuel that pushes as a church to be able to do what we do. And so the first week we talked about worship. Then week two, we talked about discipleship. Today we're talking about community. And so I want to start off by just uh, throwing this truth out there um, that I believe a lot of you guys are going to be um, agreeing with me. It's something that we've heard for so long, and we actually try. There's so many books that have been written that push us to, to be able to do this because it's a good thing. And it's this truth. It's the truth that we have to try our best to be truth and truthful to ourselves. That if we lie to ourselves, we'll be committing the biggest atrocity to ourselves that we could ever do. We won't be able to change. We won't be able to prosper. We won't be able to be successful if we're continuously lying to ourselves. And so we're all in agreement with that. As believers, we also believe that as you're truthful with yourself, you also, you're also truthful with God. God knows you, but he gives you the opportunity and the space to be able to, for you to be able to share with him your deepest secrets, your, your struggles, the fears that you may have. And you'll grow as a believer the more honest you are with God. And I think till up to this point, all of you guys will be in agreement with me. Be truthful to yourself and be truthful to God. But there's a third aspect of being truthful that sometimes we miss out. Or we, or we think that it's not as important as being truthful to ourselves and to God. And, and the third one is, you be truthful with other people. See, it's a lot easier sometimes to stand in the room by yourself and speak to yourself, no matter how hard the subject may be. Or even in prayer, when we, when we get on our knees and we start praying to God and opening our hearts. But there's something that's really difficult and hard about opening up to other people. Especially if you're in leadership or if you are leading a group or if people hold you in high esteem, there's something about that that limits us in being transparent, honest, and vulnerable with other people. But the reality is, and we believe strongly here at Revive Church, that you grow in community, that you're able to heal in community, that if you stay away from people and you stay away from being transparent and honest with others, you won't grow. You, you'll eventually, spiritually, or even emotionally, you'll, you'll be depleted. You, you'll find death in certain areas in your life that you could have found life if you would have been in community. And this is the thing. When someone like myself comes in and challenges you to, to be in community, the first thing we think is, I can't. I, I don't have the time. I, I have so many things on my plate. I cannot make time to give someone else good community. Or, or maybe you're like, you know what? I can't do it because community means that you have to help other people. And, and I could I could barely help myself. I got such a great load and so many things that are burdening me. I got so many things I'm working on. How am I going to be able to help someone else? And so when we look at scripture, there's this person called Paul. And if someone knew trouble or weight or being busy, it had to be Paul. See, the Bible says that Paul had many troubles. And among some of them, the fact that when Paul got converted and became an apostle, his peers, the people around him, did not believe his conversion. They would, they would doubt it all the time. They would doubt his ministry or his profession. His message was rejected continuously. He was beaten and stoned. He was imprisoned. He was deserted by his friends. He, he even invested in people who ended up backsliding or falling away. He had lack of money, lack of finances. He found himself in circles where... He, People were competing against his own sermon, sometimes even going after him and trying to discredit what he had preached. He was persecuted, oppressed. He was, he was, he fought himself uh, against people who were in influence. And if that was not enough, he was shipwrecked, dropped in an island and all these different stuff that happened to his life. But yet again, when we read Philippians chapter 4, we find, we find Paul mentioning some truths that I believe that if today you, you take the time to, to internalize them and just process them through, will we'll bring you into the space of understanding that community is important. 
Not only because it's something that we say at church, but it's because it's something that we live by and something that, to be honest, has brought us through. As pastors and leaders at Revive Church, uh, we, we're standing here, and I'm honestly telling you, we're standing here because we live in community, because we're transparent with the people that are around us, because we decided not only to be in community for the sake of having support, but also being support to other people and letting, letting them come in into our hearts as well as we want as we want them or to open their hearts up to us. And so I want you to go scripture with me, Philippians chapter 4, verse 1, and it says, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm in the Lord in his ways, dear friends. So I, I love how he starts because he starts off by letting them know what they mean to him. And obviously, these were not just people that he was writing to. These were people that he loved. He dearly loved. And not only that, he said, I long for you. I, I want to see you. I want to be in community. I want to be close to you. Paul will explain a little bit later why they had this place in his heart and how their, their love for Christ and their love for him had pushed them to love them as well. In verse 2, it says, I plead with Idonia and Syntyche to be on the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. See, it's interesting how Paul starts off by identifying his love for them, but then continues to point out something that he wants them to work on. And as parents, um, we understand very well that part of loving our children is that we correct them. And I'm going to be honest with you. Whenever I'm correcting Joshua or Jacob and, I, and, I, and I, um, I prevent them from doing something or I take something away from them uh, in order to teach them a lesson, it hurts me, but more than it hurts me, it, it gets me mad when they question my love for them because I corrected them in something or I took something away from them. And the reason why I, I, it hurts me or it bothers me is because of all the other stuff that I've shown them love through. Like how I buy them stuff, I provide for them, I love them, I care for them, I give them words of affirmation, I pray over them every night, I spend time singing songs with them, I throw myself on the floor with them, I go to the park with them, I do all this stuff that shows my love for them, and it irks me that whenever I correct them, they translate that as lack of love. As parents, we understand that, right? But when we look at our relationships, for whatever reason, we tend to do the same things our kids do. Whenever we have friends or family or we have people that we, we, we talk to who we consider friends, sometimes we think that the only, the only thing they could do as friends is support us, help us, or encourage us. But Paul is letting us know that if you love someone, correction is part of that chemistry. That, that, that correction is actually needed in a relationship. That if you're going to live in community with people, not only are you going to support each other, but you're also going to correct each other. You're going to push each other towards change. And we also hope that as you watch all these sermons this week, last week, and the weeks before, that you've also felt that little push and that nudge. That, that you feel the words coming through the screen and, and they're encouraging you and they're letting you know what you, be, what you could become in Christ. But at the same time, you, you, hear, us, uh, uh, you hear us pointing towards the things that, that, that have to change in your life in order for you to see change in your future. And so Paul does that, right? And it's beautiful. And then he continues. In verse 4, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, this is astonishing for the simple fact that when Paul is writing his letters to the church in Philippi, he is in prison. Mind you, I just mentioned a bunch of stuff that he went through. And at this stage in his life, he's in a prison, most likely malnourished. Most likely he's sick. Most likely he's in a, in a dark room by himself. And yet again, he finds the strength to write to them such words as rejoice, gentleness, thanksgiving, and peace. How? How is it that in such a dire situation, he still finds the strength to encourage them this way? How is it that in a, in a space so, so negative like the one he is, he still finds the encouragement or the strength, sorry, to encourage the people who he's writing to? 
See, the thing is this. When you and I are not in community, when we are by ourselves and we're our thoughts only, we start focusing on the circumstances and that leads us to content instead of a contempt instead of content. And we start we start looking at everything that we have. We start, you know, dismissing the blessings that we have. We start looking at all, all the things that other people have and comparing to what we have and what we have to go through. Because all you could do when you're in a negative space is focus on the negative things in your life. See, but Paul understood that in order for him to be able to experience life outside of the circle that he is, of the things that he's going through, he was going to do it through the lens of community. And if we look uh, a little bit further in the verse, in verse, in verse uh, 10, it says, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renew your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but not, had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstance. You notice that? He says, look, I've been able to go through good times and bad times, but I have been able to learn how to be happy and content with what I have when I notice or recognize that I am in a community. See, when I'm by myself, I am limited to what I possess. But when I'm in community, I could borrow strength. I could borrow vision. I could borrow faith from those around me. And my, my, my faith, my resources are not limited to what I have, but they're limited to my community. And Paul says, look, I'm so happy that you've renewed your, 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 your care for me because, because through the past, and he says in verse 14, he says, yet it was good for you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of our acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you. And notice he says, no other church uh, was with me in the matter of accepting and receiving because it was something that they did with each other. He said, I would give you, you would give me, uh, you would give me, and I would give you. And we were in this relationship as a community, and that gave me strength. That's why Paul is able to have such encouraging words to this church. Because that, that, there had been an initial investment in community that gave him the strength to be able to do so. See, what we, what we must understand is this. The community is not so much about carrying each other's burdens as much as it is carrying each other's burdens to God. See, it doesn't mean that when I get in community, all my problems are solved and, I'm, and everything's going to be, you know, uh, uh, daylight and shine. No, no, no. We're going to go through dark times. But community is not there to take away our problems. Community is there to help us have a clear view of the path. We're able to see where we're walking, where we're going, our, our, our steps in a more clear way because it's not limited to our site, but to our community site. And so today, as we come to the conclusion of this time together, there's two questions that I want to challenge you with. And the first one is, have you identified the community that you're supposed to be a part of? So I'm hoping that if you're watching this program, you're connected to a church. You're part of our Revive family. But I don't want you just to come to our services. I don't want you just to listen to the sermons. I don't want you just to live your life alone. I want to encourage you to identify a community you can be part of. Maybe there's somebody in your, in your, in your church, in, in, in the place where you serve, in, in your uh, school, in your family. People of like faith that you could connect to. But you must learn to identify the community that you need. And second question that I want to encourage you with is, ask God, not what, but who? Think about the need that you have right now. Think about the need that you're asking God for, for him to fulfill. What if you were to change that? And instead of saying, God, help me, help me uh, uh, record this, or, or Lord, help me accomplish this, or Lord, help me get that. How about you start asking God, Lord, who can I be in community with that can help me grow in this area? Lord, who could, be, who could I be in community who I could learn how to be better in this area of my life? Who can I be in community where I could give into? Not what, but who? See, the Apostle Paul ends his his uh, letter to the church of Philippi by saying these words. I have received, in verse 18, I have received full payment and have more than enough. 
and I am amply supplied now that I have received the gift that you sent. And I'm going to butcher this name. If a, if for Dotrizes, something like that, right? And he says these words. He says, I have received from you guys what you guys gave to him. See, I couldn't, I couldn't get from you guys because there was no medium of transportation. There was no way that you could get what you wanted to give to me. And so there was somebody in the middle in community with you and with me. And through the community that we had with this same person, we were able to be a blessing to each other. You see, this brother didn't have what I needed, but you guys did. And so he gave to you, or they, you guys gave to him, and he gave to me. And I could give him this letter, and he could transport this letter to you, and we could be a blessing to each other because we are in community. And I encourage you today, as you're watching this, and maybe as I have been speaking, certain people have been coming to your mind, and, and even maybe some excuses that you have been making up or you've been looking at or focusing on, that has been challenging. And so I encourage you today, pick up that phone and, and call somebody who you could be in community with starting this week. If you come to church on Sunday, if you visit us by any chance, make sure that you don't leave a service without connecting with somebody and taking the initial steps to be part of a community. Because here at Revive, we, we don't just say this. We don't just speak these words. We, we believe it. And we have seen it over and over again. That you, you die in isolation, but you heal in community. That if you isolate yourself from others, you will be limited just to your resources. But if you get in community, there is something beautiful about living a life in community. I'm a result of that. Our church family is a result of that. And we want you to be a result of that. I'm looking forward to seeing you next week as we continue on in our series. And if you have time this week, take a couple of minutes and re-watch this message and watch uh, last week's and the weeks before and get the full idea of what we're trying to convey to every single one of you. And we hope that as you translate these words into your heart, that these words in your heart may translate into action. See you next time and God bless you.